Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Doing Well, the Wellbeing Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Blue Mo, coming to your ears from NARM, Melbourne, Australia, Let's learn together. Uh, Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, And from the past as well, you're from yesterday and we're in the future. So, so glad we could finally make this happen. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So um, I uh, told you a little bit earlier when we were doing sound check and I actually showed you, you know, I've got a copy of your book. I've read your book mm-hmm. and um, our mm-hmm. team has read your book as well. We're huge fans of your work. And uh, the the part about the interview that we're going to talk about today, we're going to touch on a lot of the insights that you mentioned in the book. And hopefully you can share some of that with the audience, especially for those who haven't read the book before. Um, sure. And uh, we think that, you know, for a, a, a topic like, um, self-compassion and emotional intelligence, there's just a lot of nuances and each person sees it in a a different light, um, which is why we really want to draw on your expertise today. And um, I always like to welcome the guests to the show because it's about well-being. Uh, We want to create a really, just like a calm and zen environment before we start. And we would love to invite you to introduce yourself. It could be your professional background or your personal interest, anything that you would like the audience to know. So go for it, Mark. Hello, everybody. I am Mark Brackett, and I uh, am a husband. I am a owner of two cute Morkies, and I'm also a professor of psychology and the director of a Center for Emotional Intelligence. Amazing. <laughs> I love the part where you're just like, you're the owner of the two. Was it Husky, you said? Morkies. M-O-R-K-I-S. Morkies. They're oh, a sorry. mixture of yeah. Morkies and Yorkies. Ah, okay, gotcha. I was like, Morky, that's new to me. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't seen them before. So you got to send us a photo somehow. We need to see them. Um, re- really great. Thank you for the really humble introduction. You know, your work really speaks for itself. And in fact, uh, my some of my ex colleagues in the past uh, actually introduced me to this book, and you know, they're huge fans mm-hmm. of your work. So I'm sure they'll be really interested and excited to listen to this interview when it's live. Um, so today, uh, we want to really know know you a bit better before we jump into the interview part, which is why we have a section called Have You Met Mark? And here Uh we will ask for your five recommendations on five different things, just to know what you've been up to, what you like recently, and uh, maybe some of the audience can actually, you know, take your recommendation on board. So the first thing we want to ask is what book would you recommend or what book have you been reading recently? So I've been reading a lot of books because I'm starting my next book, and I'm trying to read everything I can to make sure that what I do is original. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a book that I really like by um, Vivek Murthy, who is the Surgeon General of the United States, and it's called Together, because um, I think we are in a crisis of connection, and I think we should read and think more about our relationships. Mm. Yeah, that is so true. I, I read something about connections recently, and it's definitely what you just mentioned. So we're excited to know about more about your new book. Can you maybe tease us a little bit about what it's going to be about? Is that? Well, my first book, okay. as, you, as, I, as you know, is called Permission to Feel, which is my yeah. kind of my life's work and my baby. Um, but then, you know, that book was published right before the pandemic. Yeah. And so um, I think I've done, I've been successful at giving everyone the permission to have their feelings and understand that emotions are data and information. But now people are like, I need better strategies to deal with all those feelings. And so um, my next book goes deeper into how to regulate. How do you Mm. deal with your feeling? Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Okay. I'm excited. 
definitely going <laughs> to put that on the list and, you know, bookmark when it's going to be out. So great. I got to write uh, first. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, and you know what? It's it's great to find out from you directly because you know, like I don't I don't find out through, about it through social media, which is even better. So this is r- really rare, uh, and I appreciate it. Thank you for letting us know, and I'm sure whoever has read your first book would be really keen to read the second one as well. Um, fantastic. So, how about a movie you would recommend to our audience? All right, there's a new movie that I saw that I was overwhelmed by, but loved. And I'm not, not going to remember the title, but maybe you'll know it. It's like everything about everywhere and everything. Oh, yes. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Yeah. I love that movie. Yeah, it was, it was so strange at the beginning, but towards the yeah. end, it was kind of like, oh, everything makes sense now. Yeah. I need to watch it again, actually, because I think I was so stimulated and overwhelmed by the movie that I need, I couldn't process it. And so now I got to yeah. go back and yeah. really absorb it. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I laughed so hard throughout the movie that I was like, initially I was kind of like, what is this about? Like, I'm just laughing so hard. And then, yeah, afterwards when I did my reflection, I was like, actually, no, it's not just funny. It has lots and lots of meanings. So that's a really great one to recommend. And as somebody else on our show has also recommended that movie, I think. So, you know, it's oh, like, funny. it's kind of like a, yeah, it's like a big, movie nowadays and yeah everyone should really watch it how about a podcast that you listen to frequently yeah i've done probably 300 podcasts and i don't listen to many of them to be honest with you because (laughs) makes sense yeah um you know the one that i um have appreciated just because my work was showcased in it and um is Brene Brown's podcast um mm. called Unlocking Us and uh oh my gosh wait the, you were uh, on Unlocking Us mm-hmm. oh my gosh I'm so sorry I didn't know that I'm just such a huge fan of the both of you and I don't know how I missed that episode uh, so it was, I'm... <laughs> it was actually I think her fifth guest uh, uh, back on the podcast and gosh. um I just appreciate you know the um, the guests that she's had and, um, and just, you know, the, the focus on vulnerability. Yeah, absolutely. I love that show. I haven't listened to all of the episodes, but yeah, I think it's just so amazing how she can, um, let the guest open up and really talk about, you know, some of the stuff that people would avoid talking about a lot of the time. So yeah, uh, I, actually, I'm, I'm actually Jumping into the podcasting world and yeah. in the fall, I'm launching a new podcast called Entirely Human. And um, I can't tell you the details about it, but it's going to have a new twist on what it means to be a human being. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. So we're finding out more and more about what you're up to now directly from you. Yeah. There you go. What a treat. Thank you so much for letting us know. And yes, sure. um, Unlocking Us, a great, great podcast. I'm excited to listen to your show. I actually don't listen to that many podcasts myself. So I totally understand when you said you've done many podcasts, but you don't listen to that many podcasts. Totally relatable. Yeah. Yeah. How about a famous role model or a role model of yours? You know, I'm going to, um, given what you told me about your background, one of my famous, one, a role model who I actually had the opportunity to learn from and admire deeply, um, was Thich Nhat Hanh mm. and, uh, who is a Vietnamese monk who yeah. unfortunately lived in France and other places for, uh, political reasons back early in time. Yeah. And, uh. I just think his work on mindfulness is the best. Yeah. Gentle spirit, yeah. beautiful yeah. mind. Yeah, calm, absolutely. Caring, compassionate, as you said. Mm. Yeah, so true. And I think it's it's a, a, it's a sad thing for us because, you know, he's gone now. But um, I guess one of the beautiful things that we'll never lose is his insights, you know, some of his, right. um, you know, like teachings and meditations and things that we'll forever cherish because, you know, thanks to the internet, you know, we'll, we'll, we've captured that forever. And um, yeah, I think he's definitely one of the people that um, we should 
definitely look into, you know, whether you're into mindfulness or not. Because I think I don't know, at one point or another, you know, you, you definitely benefit from that. Completely. Yeah. Really great. All right. So I know that you're the t- director for or the Center for Emotional Intelligence, I believe. And so you are definitely teach a lot, I, I guess. Uh, how mm-hmm. about a course that you've completed, like the course that you've taken recently? Well, um, other than the required kind of ridiculous stuff for jobs, right? <laughs> <laughs> like my my human resources uh, trainings and my uh, you know HIPAA compliance trainings, human subjects training. Um, I've done a lot of those recently because I'm behind on all those required things. <laughs> um, What's the most memorable one you had to take then? Oh, you know, I think the most memorable course that I've taken actually. Um, is uh, I'm following a new yoga teacher and um, it, it was like a 30 day practice. Yeah. And I'm going to call that like, I have, um, I have a new found kind of like obsession for physical activity, uh, but meaningful physical activity. And so I've been just really loving this course and I'm, I'm in the midst yeah. of it and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, that's great. Is it an online course? Or are you actually going to mm-hmm. the y- yoga studio in person? No, it's online. This is a guy who like, he's like, you know, in Ecuador, then he's in Bali, and then he's in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, great. Great to know. Yeah, I, I love doing three days yoga as well. One of my favorite is uh, yoga with Adrian. She does free Three day yoga at the beginning of every year, and like it's a like it's an amazing way to start the year. Or you know, sometimes you miss it at the beginning, and then you're like, you know what? It's March. I'm going to do it. It's still nice that three mm-hmm. days um, journey take you somewhere else completely. So I'm glad you're doing that, and you know, like uh, sharing mm. this. It's a really different kind of course normally because like when we ask the question about courses, people would kind of go, oh, something about my my field or you know like something about my studies and it's it's very rare like a course about like physical activity so this is really nice yeah great so now we've got to know you a bit better you know your Mm -hmm. um, areas of interest uh, what you've done and especially what you've done um, in in collaboration with others and what you're about to do as well Um, and I think uh, that's just like a just a little bit, like a drop in the ocean compared to all that you've done. Um, and I'm sure our audience would look you up and find out more about yourself um, once they've listened to this episode. Now, let's go into the interesting part of this um, conversation. And I'm really excited about this because I'm keen to find out what, what your take is on the topic of self-compassion um, and you know emotional intelligence and also well-being because our show is about well-being. We have a really big mm-hmm. focus on um, helping everyone improve their well-being. But right. we always want to know from your your perspective as an expert in the field, um, what do you think well-being means? What does it mean to you in particular? Because it means different things to different people. Well, as it happens, our team studies well-being. And um, I see it in four parts. Um, physical well-being, like does my body feel well? Um, the second, social well-being. Do I feel like I have healthy and positive and good relationships? The third, you know, we'll just call this kind of emotional well-being. Like, do I experience more pleasant than unpleasant emotions on a daily basis? And then the fourth, we'll call it kind of purpose and productivity well-being. Like, do I feel passion for my work? And do I feel, you know, um, inspiration and awe, you know, in terms of, you know, the things that I spend my time on? So I see it like four, physical, Mm. social, emotional, and we'll call it workplace or kind of purpose yeah wow okay that's expands my understanding of it quite a bit because i think normally what i know and what our guests have shown is kind of like we package it in you know this 
this bubble called well-being, then you know, like it's um, it generally really like a, a small definition, and it's not um, categorized like you just said. But that really got me thinking. So um, I, I guess we all have different ways to define it, but based on your work, that's probably closer to what we should really look into when we think about our well-being. Um, and we'll unpack one of those aspects in a little bit. So, sure. okay, we've talked about well-being. And I'm sure, uh, as you mentioned, your team uh, does a lot of research into well-being. So what would be some of the misconceptions that you notice um, about well-being? What do people get wrong when it comes to well-being? I think the big, 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 big one is that everybody thinks it's about happiness. Yeah. And that the goal is to be happy all the time. Mm -hmm. And I find that super problematic. One, you know, it just creates that kind of toxic positivity environment where, you know, people are like, telling them that everything's going to be great, you know, or they're constantly striving to find ways to experience those high energy, pleasant feelings. And, you know, I'm not one of those guys, right? I'm a, I'm an introvert who is kind of mellow and slightly anxious. Um, and so the, the pressure to be happy um, makes me uncomfortable. And also like, I don't know about you, but when I'm around people who are happy all the time, they drive me out of my mind. And so, um, <laughs> I yeah. like more, I like people who experience the full range of emotions and who have strategies to manage their emotions. So, um, I think that's a big issue for me and yeah. in the work that I do in schools, everybody thinks the goal is to be happy. And I try to tell people like, we're in a pandemic, like the goal is to survive and thrive, not necessarily to be happy every day. Mm, yeah. I think that that's really soothing to know because you're right. A lot of people uh, make you feel like you have to be happy all the time. And I, I think I appreciate those with high energies for sure. Um, but it's definitely impossible to be happy all the time. And also sometimes I feel like there's um, a trend of toxic positivity as well. Like, and this can happen anywhere. You know, it could, it could happen um, in your wider family, your extended family, or it could be in your workplace. Um, and it doesn't really help your well-being, to be honest. So I appreciate you saying that it's not all about being happy all the time. It cannot be. Um, and it I relate be. with you as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that is um, well-being. And you've addressed one of the massive misconceptions when it comes to well-being. And I totally agree with you. How about the definition of self-compassion? Because that's what we really want to talk to you about today. Yeah. So, I mean, I think of it as very simple. It's just being kind, right? Um, and it's easy, I think, to define self-compassion when you think about the opposite, which is self-criticism, right? Um, uh, being judgmental of how you're feeling, you know, judgmental of your anxiety or frustration or your anger. And so, um, you know, this is a, this area of, is of high interest to me because of my own childhood and the struggles that I had as a child. And I was not very self-compassionate. I was very self-critical, you know. And I think our society really, and I'm not saying just America, I'm saying everywhere, um, just because of the way we're living right now with social media and the social comparisons, it's really hard to be self-compassionate because everybody's smarter, everybody's better looking, everybody's got better makeup, everybody's in better physical condition, everybody's richer and everybody's this. And it just creates this, endless amounts of envy and yeah. jealousy. Um, and so I actually see um, self-compassion as a primary goal in today's society. Wow. You're, 
yeah, you, you kind of unpack it in really simple terms and there's nothing we don't already know. But I guess in a way, we sometimes forget about self-compassion because of how we are living. Sometimes I think understanding what you're saying is kind of like sometimes you go on social media, you see somebody else doing you know, better than you. And then, you, you know, your day's going well so far. And then you look at that and you're like, hmm, I'm a failure. Or you make a mistake. Right? You know, you make a mistake and you're like, yeah. you're such an idiot, Mark. <laughs> or you think something, you know, that was not kind yeah. to somebody. And you're like, you're nasty. Yeah. You're not a good yeah. person. Yeah. Instead of, you know, I always say, you know, my book is called Permission to Feel. And I always say, with permission to feel, you have to give yourself permission to fail. Yeah, And with that permission to fail, you have to give yourself the permission to apologize and ask for forgiveness to self and other and repair and grow. Yeah, And I think that we don't teach self-compassion. I think we teach people to be self-critical because we're critical of people. You know, parents, you know, we grow up and, you know, you didn't study hard enough. How did you do that? Why'd you do that? How, how would you talk to that way? You know, it's just endless amounts of criticism. Yeah. And I think what happens is that we become gaslit by people and we start believing the reality that other people have created for us. Yep. You're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too dark, you're too light, your nose is too big, your nose is too small, whatever it is. It's like endless amounts of criticism that then becomes your self-talk. Yeah, I guess it's a bigger issue than it, it actually is. And you know, I've been reading up on this quite a bit because, you know, some some days, uh, if I'm completely honest, you know, things go well, but then all of a sudden there's that feeling of uh, I'm not feeling as good as I should feel. And uh -huh. then it's kind of like, oh, uh, why am I feeling that way? Why am I criticizing myself for not feeling good? You know, like it's, it's kind of like a, an endless vicious cycle. I, I should allow, again, give myself permission to feel those feelings because once I've done that, I'll be able to unpack what actually happened and then, you know, have strategies to deal with that. There's no such thing as a bad feeling. Yeah. Think about that. Mm. Wow. That's a, that's a really, that's a really interesting notion. I guess this is new for a lot of people, you know? Because mm -hmm. we, we all we always label, you know, feelings. Okay, it's a good feeling. It's a bad feeling. So now that you've said there's no such thing as a bad feeling, can you unpack it a bit more? What do you mean for, for those who have not heard of this before? Yeah. So, you know, from our perspective, all emotions are information. Every emotion is a piece of data. It's about your experience in the world. So if you say something that's mean and hurtful, I may feel bad or I may feel angry. If you promise me something and don't fall through, I'm going to feel disappointed. If I achieve a goal, I may feel pride. If I feel like everything's going well, I may feel content. Um, and it's not that content is better or worse than anger. It's just, this is life. And so, you know, Yes, you want to experience more of the pleasant emotions than the unpleasant ones. But life, you know, I lost my mother when I was in my early 20s to pancreatic cancer. And so, like, I felt sad and I felt grief. And I don't want someone to say things like, you know, don't worry about it, you know, or like, you know, you got to come on, come on, Mark, you know, cheer up. It's like, why do I have to cheer up? I just lost my mother. You know, I want to reflect a little bit. I want to have some nostalgia. Um, and so, and also these negative so-called emotions have a function, right? Anger is telling us there's an injustice. Let's go fight for the, what's right for people. Um, so I just think that the more we can think of emotions as information, um, the healthier we'll be about how we kind of work with our emotions. Yeah. Wow. That's really great. It's just a really like soothing again, reminder that it's okay to feel however it is you're feeling because that's giving you information to understand your own self better and show yourself compassion, 
which is what we're talking about it's today. About time, right? The way I think about it is about intensity and duration. And so if you're angry or you're feeling livid all the time, not good. You know, it's not going to be helpful to have well-being and build good relationships. But if you feel angry a little bit because of something someone did, go for it. Makes sense. Maybe you can conjure up the courage to tell them that they should never do it again and make a change in the world. Mm. Yeah. I think a lot of us forget to do that or sometimes we're just afraid. Because yeah. I think the, the first step is just recognizing that emotion altogether. And like you said, it gives us information. But um, I think for a lot of um, us, even adults, because I think in your book, you mentioned, you know, like teaching your child to actually you know, embrace their emotions and understand their emotions. But we didn't get taught that as kids, I would say, which is actually quite sad because it's like the most important thing to get taught, I would say. Um, I agree. Whereas, yeah, whereas now we, uh, we we didn't get taught that when we were kids and now we've grown up to be adults and then sometimes we kind of go, these feelings are just really uncomfortable. They're bad. I don't want to feel them. Or, uh, you know, like I'm a failure or like I, I'm bad. I'm a bad person, things like that. And it's just, um, I think it's just simply because we don't have the tools. We didn't get taught the the right thing, equipped with the I right tool to, more. you know, deal with that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this is because I've read your book, so I have mm -hmm. this little bit uh, better of understanding and, you know, show myself a bit more compassion, self-compassion. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, because you've done a lot of work into this, it's better to hear from you. What do you think would be to the relationship between self-compassion and well-being? You know, how can we leverage self-compassion to improve on our well-being in all of those different aspects? Yeah, well, I see, you know, self-compassion as a practice and I see it as a strategy. So what I mean by that is you can apply self-compassion to a wide range of things. So let's imagine um, I say something that's not kind to somebody, which happens. I mean, I try to think of myself as the feelings master, but I mess up a lot. And, um, and so in that moment, um, I'm going to say things like, Mark, how could you say that? You know, gosh, you're the director of the Center for Freaking Emotional Intelligence, right? You shouldn't be, you know, like you're, that's awful and you should be embarrassed as opposed to, you know something, Mark? You messed up. Something like, let's try to understand, you know, what triggered you and what you think was underneath that kind of nasty response. And let's learn from it. And if you need to apologize, great. If not, that's okay too. But let's learn from this so that we can grow. To me, that's the self-compassion piece of healthy emotion regulation. Yeah. But it's important that you know, this has to be taught. It's not something that you just kind of think of on your own. Yeah. It's really, you know, it's just, you just don't. You've got to see it modeled in the world. And then you got to practice it. And then you fail at that too. Because, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to, been, try, I've tried to be self-compassionate and it just like doesn't work. Mm. You know, uh, I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, I was working from home like most people were, if they were able to. We had to because our university was shut down. And um, I was like sitting at my kitchen table watching the news every day. The stock market was crashing. I'm like, What's happening to my center? And um, the spiral of the negativity this is never going to work it's going to fall apart i can't believe this nobody's going to want to do this anymore what am i doing what is anybody else doing then i had to catch myself and say mark how much control do you have over this virus like i can do what i can do i can put a mask on i can stay away from people blah 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 but um and so to me at a at the broadest level 
Self-compassion is continuously applying helpful emotion regulation strategies as opposed to unhelpful ones to deal with life's emotions. That's a beautiful summary. And I guess in the, in this context, because we're talking about well-being, um, like you said, it's not easy. It's not something that you just pick up or you just know. You need to be taught and you need to learn. You need to, yeah, you need to actually uh, know what to do and, and how to embrace and deal with these emotions. And in turn, for our well-being, I guess it really helps to allow ourselves to just be in whatever, whichever state that we're in so that we understand what's going on, especially to deal with, uh, you know, future situations better, perhaps. And, you know, I think overall that helps with our well-being because we manage ourselves better. Uh, yeah. We're able to, you know, like we're able to deal with the bad emotions, you know, again, no, no such thing as, as no bad emotions. Emotion. Yeah, no such thing as bad emotions, but when someone ones. Un yeah, unpleasant ones. Um, if someone is dealing with the unpleasant emotions, the next time um, they know how to deal with it. And I think that really helps with our well-being. What do you think? I couldn't agree more. And we need different things for different aspects of our well-being, right? Yeah. So you need to engage in that physical activity and healthy eating and good sleep for your physical well-being. You got to build and maintain healthy relationships and stay connected for the social well-being. Yeah. You got to just have fun in life, right? And try to just laugh a little bit <laughs> to have that kind of emotional well being. And then you got to pursue things that interest you and, and be in like that learner mode, you know, to have that kind of workplace, you know, well being. And I think that has to be taught explicitly. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Which is your whole life's work, right? That's what you you've been working on. So we're going back to basic. It's just you know, like let's ask Mark about this uh, some more. Okay, so uh, we we've covered self compassion. We've covered um, the relationship between self compassion and well being. Um, but in your work now, we're going deeper into this um, and and for it to be taught to people, of course, it's not going to be something we solve in 20 minutes. Um, but no. just uh, as, as a start, how would you define the relationship between self-compassion and emotional intelligence? Because that's your expertise area. Well, it's, you know, just go be more elaborate about what I just said. And so self-compassion is helpful for well-being. And so people who are higher in emotional intelligence evaluate their strategies for dealing with their feelings. And if they're unhelpful, then that's not compassionate. Yeah. And if they're helpful, helpful they are. So you can do this for all strategies. So, you know, are you drinking too many alcoholic beverages, you know, and kind of getting wasted? You know, that's not being self-compassionate, right? That's being a self-saboteur. You know, it's not good for your physical health. It's not good for your emotional health. It's not good for your relationships, most likely. Um, if you're doing a lot of negative self-talk, right? Not helpful for your well-being. So how do you go from negative self-talk to self-compassionate talk? You know, if you are dismissive and unkind and say mean things, that's not good for relationships. So then you got to like, think about how you can be not only other compassionate, well, I would call it other compassionate, right? In terms of, um, which by the way, you know, from an emotional intelligence standpoint is a way of building self-compassion because I think it was Gandhi who said, lose your, uh, to find happiness, lose yourself and others or something along those lines. And so, you know, when you, are kind and compassionate to others. You see it in their facial expressions, in their body language, in their behavior, like they light up. And we like to see people light up. And in turn, that makes us feel more pleasant emotions. So when you're kind to others, you actually are being self-compassionate. Mm, beautiful. Well, um, I guess we didn't realize that, you know, most of us, we didn't know that being kind to others could in turn 
means that we're being kind to ourselves and showing self-compassionate. So And selfishly, you know, when you get older and you need some help, people are going to want to be around you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's kind of, uh, it depends on your intention as well. You don't want to be the selfish person who is kind of going and saying, I'm kind to you so that you can be kind to me. But it's it's much exactly. broader than that. You know, it's 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 more so it's a way of life for you because it helps. Once you're able to help yourself, you're able to help others. Uh, once you help others, in turn, you also help yourselves. I, I guess it's, uh, it's just something to to keep in mind because if, if I think the, the intention, you know, whenever you go from a place of, um, of selfishness, it defeats the whole purpose and it's not going to be helpful in the long run. I agree. Okay. So we uh, touched on your book a little bit and I really love the, the title of the book because, you know, like first time uh, I saw the book, I was like, permission to feel. Do I have permission to feel? Why is there a book about p permission to feel? You know, like, why do we need permission to feel? And then you, you unpacked all of that in your book. So, you know, like, again, for anyone who hasn't read it, they need to go read it. But um, in, in the context of, uh, of this podcast, I really want everyone to understand it just a little bit, a little bit more about um, what the book is about and also the, the topic of self-compassion. Um, how would you say self-compassion will help us people to have permission to feel in your words? So here's the way I think about it. And you know this from reading my book that I had a pretty difficult childhood. I had abuse in my childhood. I was terribly bullied in school and I didn't have permission to feel. I had permission to suppress my feelings and repress my feelings and eat my feelings and scream and cry. Um, and then I had this one individual come into my life who was my uncle, my uncle Marvin. And he just looked at me like no one ever looked at me before and said, Hey, Mark, like, how are you feeling really? And I shared my experience and he didn't say, I'm going to have a breakdown. Don't tell me this or toughen up. He said, we're going to get through this together. And so I have those memories of this adult with an amazing kind of warm facial expression and body language and vocal tone who created the conditions for me to be my true self. And so that's how I see the, the, the link right to between permission to feel and self-compassion yeah. because it's hard to be self-compassionate when you're in denial, when you're repressing, when you're feeling bad about yourself. It's the opposite of self-compassion it's self denigration. And, um, but my point really is, is that, we, the adults who are raising and teaching kids have to be the role models. Yeah, absolutely. See, again, we don't get taught this as kids. And so it's, it's important for all the adults in this generation to know that it's such an, a crucial skill to teach kids. And, uh, well, I would love to let you know that um, your book has been applied. Uh, my my colleague, my ex-colleague, who's now my friend, mm -hmm. uh, she's a huge fan of your work. And she actually mentioned that she has a an emotion chart. In, oh, cool. In the mood reader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In her home. And, you know, like she uses that with her daughter. And I think uh, that is right. the most beautiful thing I've ever heard for someone who read the book and, and actually by the used way, it, the insights from the book. Yeah. Talking about being compassionate and yeah. generative. So um, I had the privilege during the pandemic to collaborate uh, with the former founder and CEO of Pinterest yep. uh, and a group of people. Um, and um, he has started a separate non-for-profit that's called the How We Feel Project. And so we just released a new app that oh. is all about well-being and self-compassion. Yep. And it's free. Um, oh, so it's amazing. How We Feel. Just go to how we feel it's in it's only on ios right now to be available on other platforms soon but or you can go to how we feel .org, um, and it has the mood meter tool to build your emotional awareness 
and it has 36 research-based strategies to help people manage, and many of them are uh, around self-compassion. Wow, amazing. We didn't know that we would get that from today, and here we are, yeah, so I'm, thank I'm, you. I'm in, the, I'm in the spirit of giving away free gifts these days. <laughs> Yeah, it's really great. So today we're getting so many free gifts and I'm just so excited to get all of them. Uh, yeah, the first one is definitely this app. It's, it's already here. We can use it. So yeah, I'm just searching for it right now. Howwefeel.org. Amazing. And it's free. How amazing is that? Thank you for letting Based us know. very generous donations. It is um, available for free in perpetuity. Oh, we love that. Um, yeah, but, but I think it's it's such a such a nice thing that you mentioned because I personally think in this context of you know like self compassion, emotional intelligence, and um, our well being, uh, for having these tools for free for everyone, and uh, and once again just the importance of education for little kids mm -hmm. when it comes to emotions, emotional intelligence, and um, having self compassion for themselves. You know, it's just so important because I think a lot of kids get yelled at. Uh, like, why are you crying? Right. And exactly. that's, that's a, that's a very, like, that's a very common thing to see on the street, on the tram, train, anywhere. Why are you crying? Stop crying. And I think that is such a funny thing to witness. It's unhealthy yes. because you're, you're, you're telling your, your own children to suppress their emotions and you're not actually going to the root cause of why they're feeling the way they're feeling or why they're crying in the first place. Exactly. I see it all the time. Yeah. I saw it actually flying back. In the uh, front, and it was in the airport two days ago, and this two-year-old girl was crying, and her father just walked away from her and told the mother, "Like, you, you get her to stop crying." And I'm thinking, really, like you can't regulate your own feelings because your two-year-old is crying and being a little loud in the, you know, in the airport, and you're embarrassed. And uh, you know, what's the message there? It's, you know. Daddy walks away, you know, when things are not good. Yeah. Don't love that message. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I I think it's just, it's strange how it's still a, a thing nowadays because, you know, whenever I see that, I kind of cringe a little bit because, you know, like I'm not a, a parent yet myself, but, yeah. uh, you know, my, my cousin's. Uh, brothers, they, they have kids. And I, I feel like just for the conversations that I have with them for the purpose of um, these conversations to educate myself on how we can, you know, talk to kids in the right way um, about their emotions. I think that would be really crucial because again, they still haven't got taught this in schools as far as I know. And yeah. um, they're not going to, I mean, they're not gonna I mean I, this is my, yeah. that's my career, my career, yeah. you know, my, my, our center's approach to social and emotional learning is called Ruler. And yep. we're in hundreds of schools throughout Australia, which is very exciting. Uh, yeah. We're in three or 4,000 schools across the globe now. And, um, you know, we're trying to bring these concepts into preschools and primary, elementary, middle, high school, college. Um, it's so important that this gets taught early and practiced and reinforced, you know, throughout life. Absolutely. And I think in your book, um, you, you use a really interesting terminology, which is emotion scientist. I really uh -huh. love that term. Yeah. Anything that has the word scientist in it, it's like, oh, I want to hear more about that. Uh, so uh, I think what you were talking about is you touched on a little bit about emotion scientist and emotion judge. What are the differences mm -hmm. between these two characters? Yeah, well, you're talking. You want to talk about compassion, right? Yeah. The emotions scientist is self compassion, other compassionate. They care about their own feelings. They care about other people's feelings. Um, and when they mess up, they're also kind to themselves and say, "You know what, Mark? You messed up this time. Tomorrow's going to be a better day." The emotion judge is closed, critical, and judgmental. And so the emotion judge is like, why are you so angry? Get over it, move on, right? They don't really want to learn. They don't really want to support. So as you can imagine, I am on a mission. And I want everyone who's part of this podcast and listen to it 
to become an emotion scientist. Yeah, because, absolutely. Um, we need a lot more emotion scientists than emotion judges right now. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, I think one of the things that really stood out in the context of self compassion as well, and and you know, like the comparison between emotion scientist and emotion judge. We mm -hmm. do want to nurture more emotion scientists. We all want to be emotion scientists and it's going to be a journey to get there. Uh, but I think the most important thing is we have self-talk every single day, right? We don't just talk to other people, but we actually live in our head too. And mm -hmm. um, with self-compassion, uh, as an emotion scientist, you would be able to regulate your self-talk better. I think you, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but... Um, now let's let's just say we are emotion scientists. Let's role yeah. play. How would an emotion scientist regulate their self talk? Let's just say something like you know, like you mentioned earlier, right? Um, you mentioned a scenario where you said, "Oh, Marley, why did you do that?" You know, like uh, you know, like you're you're like uh, critical of yourself or whatever. When a situation like that arise, how would an an emotion scientist regulate their own self talk? Well, the emotion scientist is listening to themselves and asking themselves questions. Is what I'm saying to myself helping me have well-being? Is it helping me build and maintain positive relationships? Is it helping me achieve my goals? Hmm. Well, all that negative talk is probably not helpful. Okay. Well, how might you shift that talk? What's going to be different? And I find, you know, what I, I always tell people, the emotion scientist is there from the beginning to the end. And so I think it's important for all of us to engage in regular reflection time to just think, you know, did I act like an emotion scientist today or did I was I an emotion judge today? How successful mm -hmm. was I, you know, in being curious and open and reflective as opposed to closed and critical and judgmental? Yeah. Right. I think um, that's a lot to take in, you know, especially for anyone yeah. who just heard the term yeah. emotion scientist for the first time. Um, but yeah, I think we'll, we'll go into the practice in a little bit to really unpack all of this and in, in practice how it, it would look. Um, and I think the final question we have in terms of like the really the big picture, the research, mm -hmm. anything that's theoretical is because we're talking about self-compassion. Mm -hmm. And we also talked about self-regulation and you know mm -hmm. emotion scientists. How would you, to sum it up, say to be the role of emotion of self-compassion in re regulating one's own emotions? How should we see that relationship? Well, I feel like I repeat myself because I'm I'm like very simple about this. Yeah, but is, I think it's good to emphasize, you know, just like yeah. to wrap up, sum up the, the 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 lesson. Let's just say it's it's been a really good lesson. Let's sum it up. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, and does the emotion regulation strategy that you apply to deal with your anger, your frustration, or disappointment, your sadness, does it help you have well being? build relationships, make good decisions. It's that simple to me. It's yeah. like uh, endlessly reflecting on, you know, is this strategy helping me to be a better person, to achieve good outcomes, or is it not? Perfect. And so, you know, not getting enough sleep is not being self-compassionate because you're going to be burnt out the next day. You know, um, Eating, you know, three pounds of sugar and carbs, probably not going to be helpful for your focus and concentration. You know, telling someone to go blank themselves, probably not great for your relationships. You know, saying I'm a loser, probably not helpful for your self-esteem. So just kind of endlessly evaluating, are these strategies working to support me in growing or are they getting in the way? And if they're getting in the way, how do we wipe them out of our head and replace them? Right. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, it's, yeah. it's a really summary to a really nice summary to the lesson that we just learned, especially for those who listen to these terminologies for the first time and mm -hmm. wonder, well, I thought I had self-compassion. Maybe I don't. Maybe it's time to you know reevaluate my strategy all along. Yeah. All right. Great. So we've talked about the theory. Now let's go into a bit more on the practi practical side of thing, which is the section we call practice debrief. We want mm -hmm. to talk about a strategy or practice or a habit that you employ yourself when it comes to self-compassion. So mm -hmm. Mark, what is the practice that you do to gain self-compassion through emotional intelligence? You're the expert. How do you use it? Um, I'm going to sound repetitive again because my I am um, endlessly trying to be more self-compassionate in my self-talk yep. yep because i'm a i'm not necessarily overly self-critical um although i can be terribly critical of myself and other people just to be honest um but i can be someone who gets obsessive and worries and you know ruminates about something and like instead of not so much self critical, but like, I can't believe this happened. You should have done this, this, and you know, you could, you know, maybe you need to try that. Maybe you need to do this. Maybe you need to try this. And, you know, like endlessly kind of like trying to solve the problem when it may not be something I can actually solve. Mm. And so right. for me, it's an, a practice of like, Mark, you did the best you can. Mark, take the high road, Mark, Mark, this too shall pass, Mark, Mark, you know you're in a really bad place right now, but you've had great days. Let this moment be one of those moments and just recognize that this is impermanent. And so I have a lot of phrases that I use yep. to help me kind of manage that chaos, self-criticism, and neurosis, I'll call it. <laughs> yeah, great. I think uh, my translation here for anyone who wants to get practical would be to actually come up with phrases for themselves. You totally. know, it's kind of like affirmation, a reassuring kind of thing. Um, and it could, it, it, I think what varies people, person to person because. Oh yeah. Mine, yeah. you know, yeah. because I, I like Zen Buddhism principles. Yeah. They're comforting to me. Okay. Um, I love the principle of impermanence. And so it just works for Mark. You know, this feeling is impermanent. You've, you've had anxiety, you're 52, you've been feeling anxious for 52 years and you've had really great days too. This is one of the rainy days, Mark. Tomorrow's going to be a sunny day. It's okay. Yeah. You know, there yeah. are sunny days. Yeah. Mm. That's great. I think in practice for some, somebody else, you know, like it could be, um, for, for you it's, you know, impermanence, but for somebody else, it could be something else. It could be like, I like to be positive about this. You know, it, it's like, no, it's yeah. a setback. But overall, it's it's a good thing. Well, or, it's going to be you know, different. Like, it's going to be different for different people of different yeah. cultural backgrounds. Exactly. Right? So all of emotion regulation is complicated because it's about who you are as a person and your cultural background and your gender and your identity. It's about the context, like where you're at, and it's about the specific feeling. You know, yeah. I always joke like. The nineties were my anger years, you know, I was angry at everything. And why did this happen? And this should have been better. And now I'm older. I don't really get angry that much. I'm just chronically overwhelmed. And so self-compassion for me is eating healthy, exercising and going to bed so they get good rest. Cause yeah. I'm not self-compassionate when I'm burnt out in the morning when I wake up. Yeah, absolutely. Really simple things, right? And everyone could do that every single day. All right, great. So I think uh, one of the things that we might not have touched on would be the challenges okay. then. Because in, in the practical sense, you know, each person has a different way of approaching self-compassion. For some people, mm -hmm. this is a completely new thing. They've never tried it before. They haven't even heard about the term. And, you know, like mm -hmm. they think, you know what? I've always been self-compassionate. But then after the podcast, I actually, yeah. I don't think mm -hmm. I've been that self-compassionate towards me. So 
what are some of the challenges you would anticipate for these people and how can they overcome them? There are a lot of barriers, you know, there are personal barriers, you know, like I'm not, like I said, self-compassionate or compassionate to others when I'm tired and irritable. Yeah. So it's like monitoring that kind of stuff. Um, if I don't, you know, um, eat enough food throughout the day, you know, that can affect it. Um, there's relational issues when you don't feel trust, you know, in a relationship. And I think right now, um, there, you know, we're in a place in our country, and, and this is worldwide, really, where we have political divisiveness. You know, we've got a war, multiple wars going on. You know, um, there's a virus that people don't understand completely. Yeah. And so there are larger environmental things that I think can really impact our self-compassion. And so personal, relational, kind of societal, I think we need to look at all those, you know, and, and then you have to try to regulate the barrier. So for example, if I realize that I'm not very kind in the morning um, because I didn't get enough sleep, then the strategy is actually getting more sleep. If I realize I'm unkind after I'm in a meeting with one particular person because they really activate me, it's either repairing the relationship with that person or trying not to work with that person anymore. Yeah. So true. Really practical tips and tricks that everyone can apply. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, we can all pick up from those and, and you are right. We're in a, in a particular, particularly challenging time already. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, self-compassion is, is needed more than ever. And, um, there will be challenges, but it's not impossible to practice the little things like you said. You know, it could be just as simple as taking care of yourself on the daily, right? Just go to bed, eat well, exercise. Sim simple as yeah. that. Couldn't agree more. Great. Okay. So um, I think we have touched on um, a practice. You know, we've, we've discovered that it would be good for everyone to come up with um, – the terms they can use for themselves, some phrases um, combined with exercise, uh, eat, eating well, sleeping well, mm -hmm. um, and that would in turn help with their well-being. But if you were to list, uh, you know, three good things about this overall, just to sum it up, for, to encourage people to actually take this up, what would they be? It would be give yourself permission to feel all yep. your feelings. Remember, there's no such thing as a bad emotion. Yep. It would be strive to be an emotion scientist and not an emotion judge. And it would be learn healthy emotion regulation strategies like positive self-talk, reappraisal, um, self-compassion, which is built into that. Practice it, practice it, and practice it. And then when you think you've mastered it, practice it more. And I would assume you do this on the daily. Yeah. It's my, it's, yeah, it's my only survival mechanism. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's great to know because if you're doing that and you know, you're the expert, then it would encourage people who are not experts to actually do that because you're practicing what you yeah. preach. It's I'm a catastrophizer. You know, I can, I can catastrophize, yeah. you know, at the drop of a pin. Um, <laughs> and so I got to remind myself and, you know, I think related to compassion um, is gratitude, you know, is um, just remind yourself of the things, Re take a moment and think about what's going right for you. Um, Cause I feel blessed in life, you know, just to have the home that I have, to have the relationship that I have, you know, to be able to have access to healthy foods, um, to have knowledge about self-care yeah, and, and work hard to apply it. So um, I think spending more time thinking about what we're grateful for and what's going well can make a big difference. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for that. This is a yes. really good reminder for me, you know, first of mm -hmm. all, before anybody else that I need to do that. Um, I think 
uh, we're combining a lot of different practices here. It's not just mm -hmm. one thing you can do, right? It's, it's multiple things. And it always has that, that lens of self-compassion. And there's a lot of things you can do to nurture it. Um, so I think, you know, from our audience, they can pick one thing. You know, it could just be, I don't know, maybe affirmations are a bit cheesy for me. So I'm going to go with the, you know, taking care of myself on the daily and just eat well, sleep well, exercise well. Uh, but for somebody else, it could be a, you know, like you said, gratitude, keeping a gratitude journal that might help. Um, and just to like be grateful for how you are regulating your own emotions. You know, like that could yeah. be something grateful for you know it's it's hard it's not that easy even though we put them in really simple terms earlier it takes practice and also be grateful you know for the people who have made a difference in your life absolutely and try to emulate them and be more like them than the people who kind of were nasty <laughs> Again, you know, your feelings are pointing you towards the right direction. Mm -hmm. You know, like if, if you're if you're feeling grateful for this person, that's going to be something you can learn from. And um, if you're feeling like this person is giving you some sort of signs, uh, you know, like red flags or things like that, it's also a good learning experience, right? So yeah, there you go. All of those uh, little strategies. We're all trying to be emotion scientists, and you know, I'm, I'm hoping um, as, as much as you do, I guess that. We'll have more and more emotion scientists, especially parents. That's, and, that's my big goal. Yeah, there you go. Uh, fantastic. Okay, so we've got some questions from our audience. Um, two questions. Okay. I find I find these questions to be um, quite interesting. Um, I want to hear what you think as well. The sure. first question is, how do I know if I'm being self-compassionate? Tricky. Um. Because you have greater well-being in those four categories. Hmm. You feel good physically. You feel like you have pleasant emotions more than unpleasant emotions. You feel connected with others. And you feel um, you have purpose and meaning in life. Yeah. I, I think watch yourself talk as well. That will show a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For when sure. you observe, if you can observe your self-talk and identify the patterns, you definitely know if you have self-compassion. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah. The second question is, how can we express upsetting feelings in certain situations, but not make the situations awkward? That's emotional intelligence. So, you know, that's crafting message in ways that are, you know, considering how the other person will feel. So like, let's imagine that this was not going well. And I'm like, you know, Lou, like, come on, this is not working out right. <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing asking me these questions? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Right. That would not be very kind or compassionate mm. versus me expressing my emotions again, imagining the same scenario, you know, Lou, I'd love to talk about the following, mm -hmm. you know, so that my frustration, which I don't have any, just so you know, um, <laughs> thank you. Could be, could be, could come up with like, gosh, would you stop asking me so many questions and repeat? And I have to repeat myself versus yeah. I could be frustrated and say, you know, I'd love to talk about this or, you know, and so just taking a moment, to imagine how the other person will receive it. And will that make them want to approach you or avoid you? That's a good strategy. Thank you. It's yeah. a very tricky thing to go through. And I think we go through that a lot of the times as well. You know, you have this a lot, even at home, at work, you know, there will be situations where you're kind of like, oh, I'm frustrated, but I don't want to you know, dampen the mood or I don't want to throw a span in the works when something mm -hmm. critical is going on and I don't know how to express these negative emotions. Um, Correct. And so, yeah, like you said, it's just a matter of reframing how you want to approach it and go about it, right? So, exactly. There we go. We have the tips. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, and uh, I, I know that was an example, but thank you for being okay with repeating yourself and emphasizing the like different messages throughout this podcast. No, I, think, I think it's great. Uh, yeah, it's, it will be really great for anyone who hasn't 
um, touched on this topic before. This is the first time they are listening to something, a podcast about self-compassion. It's so new. Um, I'm sure people will go away with a lot of new insights and, and actions for themselves. Um, before you. we let you go, we have a final section. As I mentioned earlier, yeah. we've got open mic because okay. we want to invite our experts to talk about anything they are really passionate about and wish to share with other people. It doesn't have to be uh, self-compassion, doesn't have to be emotional intelligence. And I'm sure you're passionate about something. And I'm sure uh, you've thought about this throughout as well. You mentioned earlier that you wanted to talk about language. So what is it about language that you're so passionate about? Well, you know, the way I think about this is that emotions, the only way they're communicated, right, is through, I mean, they're communicated through facial expressions, body language, etc. But if we really want to be deeply understood, we have to be able to communicate our feelings with words. And so to me, you know, I steal a phrase that I learned from my dear uncle, which is a word is a world. And so to me, it's a human right to be given language, to be able to be self-aware um, and to communicate your needs. And so I'm just obsessed with language and words. And I, you know, I'm, you know, selfishly, uh, not selfishly, I am, uh, I'm not humble about my emotion vocabulary, right? This is what I do. I spend my life thinking about this thing, yeah. this stuff. But now what I'm obsessed with in terms of language is learning emotions that we don't have words for in English. Yeah. And so, because I think it opens our worlds up to other experiences that we're not like thinking about. So by way of example, there's a word mudita in Sanskrit, M-U-D-I-T-A which means sympathetic joy. Right. We don't have a word for that in English. Mm. But when I heard that concept of sympathetic joy, the idea of you know, observing um, others experiencing pleasant emotions, and I could like lean into that and like feel good with them and about them. That's cool. Yeah. You know, um, there are so many other words like, um, there's a fancy, there's a fun um, word in Norwegian. Um, I think it's pronounced utapples, utapples, um, which is like the the fun you have when you're drinking the first beer in the spring, right? <laughs> like we don't have a word for that. Very specific. Okay. Um, yep. Or another word that I love, which is in Japanese, is uh, sejaku. I may not be saying it right, but that's when I pronounce it, which is, it's like you're in the middle of chaos, but you can find the peace and serenity within it. Mm. Um, you know, this, these concepts are just, they're fun to think about. Yep. Absolutely. Well, my native language is not English. So that just got me thinking, you know, when I think about my mother tongue Vietnamese, I realized that. The other day I had a conversation with my friends about like one of the emotions. Now the word has completely left me. Uh, I'll have to think about it again, but you're right. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of emotions we are not able to convey in English. So sometimes we just like, oh, how do you say this? Like, I don't, I cannot explain it. It's like yeah. a really intense, strong feeling. You cannot explain it in English. So go back to basic. Uh, but I guess that's the beauty of different languages and um, especially yeah. for those who we can speak multiple them. languages. Yeah, you borrow, you learn from them, and you even discover feelings that you didn't know existed. Like you said earlier, you like, describe something so specific. And exactly. yeah, I think, I think that's beautiful. And it's fun wow. to just try that out and learn new words. Um, yeah. There's Amazing. another word, I think it's in Welsh. I have to remember yeah. it now. I think it's Hereth. Uh, H-E, I don't know how to spell it, but it's Hereth. Yeah. Um, and it's this idea of like this longing for, you know, your homeland, you know, or the romanticized past. Yeah. You know, um, and so it's nice to just like take a moment and hear a word and its definition and just like sit with it and, you know, reminisce and, you know, um, evoke that experience yeah 
And all of this is related to self-compassion and permission to feel as well. So it's not that 100%. far off from the topic. Yeah. Well, amazing. You're definitely really passionate about this area, which is why you're, you know, even the languages that you're passionate about, they are related to emotions and all of this um, different aspects of the spectrum of feelings. I wish I had more interests. I'm a little boring, I think, because all I want to talk about is feelings. But <laughs> Well, I think. I think that's what makes you special because, you know, you're really passionate about this area and all you care about is things to do with I care, I do emotional care about intelligence. Things, no, I, care, yeah. I do care about that. <laughs> but like <laughs> my, yes. primary, my primary concern yes. is honestly, my primary concern is trying to create an emotion revolution in our society. Yeah. So that every child has permission to feel. Yeah. All the adults raising kids recognize why that matters and become emotion scientists and, mm. you know, we can make the world a better place for yeah. everyone. Amazing. That's, that's really great. And yes, uh, Mark, I can assure you, are not a boring person. So yes, <laughs> this is your primary concern and I think it's a beautiful Thank thing you. I'm a to little, do. I've had a long day and I've been traveling again for work <laughs> and, yeah. um, and today I have about an hour commute and then I had tons of meetings and then came home and then I worked out. Uh, and so my, I, I apologize if my energy is very low today. I don't think it's a, it's a bad thing because, um, you know, like we still get a lot of nuggets of wisdom from you, even though, you know, you're, you're saying that your level of energy is low. So I could only imagine what it would have been like if you had your energy been much much higher but um i guess we really well, are maybe thankful I would have been, manic, it would be all over. maybe i'm more reflective and clearer than if i were like <laughs> super excited and manic you know it might be like what is he talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah it would have been a very different thing so you know we could, again very grateful for this and uh, Thank you. no matter what the emotions um people listening to this feel i guess it will add to uh, their self understanding of their self compassion. So there you go. You know, no such thing as a bad feeling. And it's all just um, a part of our bigger picture of learning. So I'll go away from today thinking about what you've shared and um, for you. you as well. You know, this is uh, like you said, your your low energy. So hey, it's great. Celebrate it. I think it's um, it's amazing that you spend that. your time after such a long day to be here with us. So we appreciate that and. Um, I, I think just to sum it up, I'm very excited about two things. So your book, the next book, you're going to have that soon. Um, and you also said you're going to have a podcast this fall. So yes. there we go. We have so many gifts coming. About, and the app, don't forget about the app. Yes. Yes. And the app, the app we just talked about today, which is how we feel. So for anyone who wants to uh, access that is free howwefeel.org. Amazing. And um, thank you again, Mark, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. You've been listening to Doing Well, the Wellbeing Science Insights podcast produced by the Wellbeing Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at we.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Lu Ngo. Thanks for tuning in.